Easter, as someone described it. And that is the story of the smashing of someone's skull. The someone being Caesar, a commander of the Canaanite army. And yes, I think it was this story that um, shortened my short series of children's addresses some 18 to 20 years ago. Um, parents were a bit concerned about the knifing of fat King Eglon in chapter 3, but they were positively apoplectic when they heard the account of Caesarea's brains getting bashed to bits. Uh, the belly was one thing of King Eglon, but the brains getting splashed, that was really the last straw. So that was the end of the series. But actually as a youngster, I quite liked this story. Um, but having done a little bit of camping with a tent in the back garden, I was always a bit puzzled as to how one of these little wooden fat tent pegs could actually be driven through somebody's head so that it came out the other side and pinned the person to the ground. Well, perhaps they had much longer, sharper tent pegs in B&Q and Canaan in those days. The other thing that puzzled me about this story was the strength of this lady, Jael. Does it not puzzle you? And I kind of imagine that she must have been um, some kind of ancient feminine equivalent of a sumo wrestler or some kind of uh, equivalent of one of these massive lady Olympic shot put champions from Lithuania or Slovenia or former Soviet bloc countries to be able to do this. So what do you say about this story? and about its being recorded in scripture I suppose a similar question that we raised last week I mean it's recorded here with apparent approval verse 23 Caesarea lay dead verse 24 25 and that day God subdued Jabin the Canaanite king so are we given the go ahead to support buy a supply of tent pegs and have them in reserve just in case we need them for Kirk Session meetings or congregational meetings. What do you say? Now I want to give some general lessons first before moving on to some particular instructions. And I think there are two things that we can say um, by way of, of general lessons. First of all, remember that this is B.C., not A.D. It's before Christ, not after Christ. Reading the story, one might say, would that Jael had read Charles Sheldon's book, In His Steps, and then as she was slithering up to Sisera, she would have stopped to think, what would Jesus do? However, Jael was born too soon, to enjoy such light. So wrote Dale Davis, very helpfully I think, to remind us that this was B.C. So you see, we can't read the Bible flat, as it were. We've got to remember that God's revelation in his book, the Bible, unfolds successively in stages and in history with more and more light until the full light comes with Jesus Christ. And of course, since Jesus' coming, Jael's spirit of revenge is outlawed by the Lord. But remember, this is B.C. and not A.D. The second thing to say is, remember this is a B.C. picture of A.D. salvation. Now we could say that the Bible doesn't commend Jael here, in print or in black and white and that's true but the problem is that the Bible does seem to approve of Jael's act 
the Bible seems to be pro-Jael. Just reading it. Why, if we turn to chapter 5, we would have found that Deborah celebrates what happened with a great victory song. And it's a wee bit like football supporters gathering uh, round the town hall, singing and celebrating after their team has brought home the cup. Here we go, here we go, here we... That's the kind of message that Deborah is giving in this song. And she really commends uh, the murderess. We read uh, in verse 24, Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. And then in the next three verses, she almost seems to savor each grisly detail as she records it with commendation. Yeah, she's quite up front and upbeat about it. It was Jael in a tent with a tent peg, she seems to say. Seems to savor the details. You know how it is with a, with a food gourmet who so enjoys tasting food that uh, he delights or she delights just to allow the taste to swirl around the mouth, luxuriating in each mouthful. And it seems as though Deborah in her song seems to savor every morsel of the murder. But let's remember the B.C. way of saying things and showing things is very stark and very brutal and very direct. A man goes on holiday and gets a phone call from a friend saying, your cat's dead. The man complained, you could have let me know a little bit more gently. For example, you could have said the first day to me, your cat's got stuck on the roof. And then the next day perhaps you could have said, your cat's slithered down the chimney. And then perhaps the day after that you could have said, well, er, actually your cat's dead. A week later, the same man on holiday got a phone call from the same friend who said, your mother-in-law's got stuck in the roof. <laughs> now that is not the B.C. way of putting things. The B.C. way in the Old Testament is often stark and brutal and very much to the point. And remember, in trying to cope with the violence here, we need to recall that Cesera was not Mr. Squeaky Clean. What does it say in the opening verses? Verse 3, He cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. And I'm sure he probably enjoyed raping young Israelitish girls and mugging old Israelite ladies. While we may object from the comfort of our study swivel chairs, let's remember we have never remotely faced anything like God's people face. The commander of the Canaanites was really the equivalent of a camp commandant in Belsen or Oustwich. We've never been within a million miles of gas chambers or stinking prisons or solitary confinement. We have not been there, done it and got the t-shirts, but the Israelites have. But I'm in danger of getting diverted. This scripture story is a B.C. picture of A.D. salvation. And all the elements of salvation are to be found here. Essentially three, it's God who saves, God's enemies are defeated, and God's people are set free. There are the elements of the gospel. Salvation is of God, and Christ defeated his enemies on the cross, and the Lord sets us free into newness of life. The gospel. So what follows that statement of the gospel? Well, a victory song. Celebration and triumph 
on the lips and in the hearts of God's people. That's a natural response from us, isn't it? And next weekend we'll be celebrating the triumph of Jesus Christ on the cross for our salvation. And communion services, which are serious and solemn, do have the note of praise and worship and celebration as we sing to God. And and I trust you'll have a great day of celebration next Sunday. Well, there are some general lessons to look at first. But now, um, more particular instructions from this very amazing uh, story recorded in Judges 4. Now, the first particular instruction, I think, is this. It tells us that sin's strategies are repetitive. Sin's strategies are repetitive. Look at the formula in verse 1. After Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now that's a familiar formula. You find it again and again in the book of Judges. We've seen it already in chapter 3 and verse 11 in reference to the first judge, Othniel. Othniel died, verse 11, verse 12. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And this formula is repeated throughout the book. When the judge dies, then the people do evil and sin again. So we see, as we've pointed out, this cycle of sin. And this cycle of sin uh, teaches us something about sin. For example, it teaches us about sin's monotony. You see, there is nothing creative about sin. Most of it has been done before. It's simply that we do the same again. Isn't that the case? Now, of course, sometimes we relish the thought of kicking over the traces and having a good time, as we say, and and perhaps sometimes the excitement of anticipating breaking some of the commandments comes home to us and we uh, perhaps anticipate kicking back the boundaries with great glee, but if we do that, what do we find? We don't find a kick, we find invariably a flat taste left in our mouths. Somebody has said about sin, the fast lane soon becomes an old rut. There's a monotony about sin. We learn also here about sin's opportunity. After Ehud dies, the people sin. It's always after a judge dies. When the judge lives, there is a kind of restraint uh, upon the people. But when the judge dies, that restraint is removed and there's an opportunity to sin. It's a familiar strategy, isn't it? When the cat's away, the mice will play. Parents go away for a weekend. Great! An opportunity for an empty and a party. And I'm speaking of somebody who's going to be leaving a house for two weeks in the good hands and safe hands of Ed. (laughs) But perhaps the session clerk may want to come up and tuck him in every night (laughs) just to make sure there's not 40 other youngsters having a rave up. There are restraints upon sin and sinning. The restraints of respectability churchianity, security. Let's be frank. There are often not opportunities to sin. But when temptation coincides with opportunity, that is a powerful cocktail. Sin's monotony, sin's opportunity... But we learn also here about sin's degeneracy. That's a big word from what I'm trying to get at is the downward spiral in people's lives when sin is unchecked. After each judge dies, the people sin. But Israel's sin gets worse and worse and worse. They become more corrupt as you read through the story of the book of Judges. When it comes to the last judge, 
There is no capacity for delivering God's people at all. And when you reach the very end of the book, you have that very famous and dreadful and dark statement, the very last verse in the book of Judges. Everyone did as he saw fit. Or as the old version puts it, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now that's the end of this cycle with its downward spiral. Now in our story, there's a more pleasing formula right at the end. The end of chapter 5 and verse 31. We read, then the land had peace 40 years. Now that formula is used when the first judge dies. Then the land had peace. That formula is used after the second judge um, died. Or, or while the second judge was uh, was delivering. I should put that another way. When the first judge had effected the deliverance, there was peace. When the second judge effected the deliverance, there was peace. When the third judge brought deliverance, there was peace. But that's the last time this formula is used in the book. There's no more peace. So things go from bad to worse. Sin's degeneracy. Now that's a cycle of sin. And it happens in a nation, in a community, and with an individual. I suppose the classic example would be Judas Iscariot. Dreadful warning of what happens when sin goes unchecked. But there are many personal examples, I suppose, individuals can think of. Many that I can think of. Think of one person way back in, in days gone by close friend, evangelical Christian, involved in the center of church life, not here, involved in leadership of young people, seemed to be a happy marriage and family and linked with many evangelical congregations in the land. Somehow a little carelessness slipped in, a little erosion of standards and values and moved away to a different part of the country and quite frankly things went from bad to worse a downward spiral and the end was he made absolute shipwreck of his life in every direction and is nowhere spiritually to be so we learn lessons here about sin's strategy and if we know our own hearts of course and the power of sin all we can say in relation to that last story is there but for the grace of God do I sin's strategy is repetitive and that's why Jesus Christ said to his followers his friends his disciples the inner circle he said Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. For while the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Now for the second practical instruction, it tells us that God's methods are consistent. Verse 3, they cry for help. Verses 4 to 7, God raises up a leader. Deborah the prophetess was raised to judge and direct and lead Israel into liberation. And that's what happens throughout the book of Judges. God's method in the book of Judges is very consistent. He raises up leaders as his people pray. Judges, the book of Judges, has a very strong doctrine of leadership. And Deborah is another of these leaders with unusual features. What are the unusual features with Deborah? Well, they're feminine features. The only woman amongst the judges. In the tribal society of Israel, Israelite women occupied a subordinate position. So this raising up of a lady leader was very rare in the Old Testament. And I can only think of another two. Can you remember them? Think of them. There was Miriam, wasn't there? of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam fame. And then there was a lady called Huldah. 2 Kings 22, hardly a household name. 
So this is rare and an exception to the rule. But what an exception was Deborah. To use a Lanarkshire way of putting it, she's some Deborah, she's some Deborah. And uh, David McAdam's title for this passage was spot on. Deborah is or was an iron lady and like Mrs. Thatcher, she really made her subordinates jump to attention. I understand from a little reading of some political biographies that uh, even some of Mrs. Thatcher's senior ministers uh, were terrified of her wrath and she could reduce some of these ministers to quivering wrecks with just a few caustic comments. Well, that seems to be similarly the response of Barak to this Iron Lady in verses 8 and 9. So how was this leader raised up? Well, God's methods are consistent. People pray and God raises up leaders. Now, I don't have to stay with this point this week because last week we looked at something similar in God using individuals. Except I want to add that it does seem as though God is very consistent to his method in church history. When you look at church history, it is remarkable how certain individuals seem to be raised up to do a remarkable job. I mean, you look at the Reformation and you must say that God raised up Martin Luther, who almost single-handedly masterminded the whole Reformation. And similarly, when you look at the 18th century and the terrible state of the country and the terrible state of the church, the moral and spiritual condition was awful. But there were one or two prayer societies around the country and what happened? Well, surely God answered prayer and raised up John Wesley and raised up George Whitfield and, and almost these two individuals turned the world upside down or at least changed the re religious landscape in this country. When you come to the 19th century and the 20th century, you must say that God raised up Spurgeon, Hudson Taylor and Dr. Billy Graham and many others. So the point is clear. God's method is consistent. It's here in Judges, it's here in church history for us to look at. People pray and God raises up helpers. So the instruction as we find it, has to be applied. Now I've always, of course, urged believing people to see the Wednesday prayer meeting as the powerhouse for the church. Do you remember Spurgeon? I think I've told this story before, how he welcomed visitors to the Metropolitan Tabernacle, that great uh, place of worship. And people were coming into the tabernacle to look round it. And he said, well, the first place I'm going to take you to is the boiler room. Remember that? And they looked at one another and said, what do we want to go to the boiler room for? We come in to see this great, uh, this building with the galleries and the pulpit and the baptistry and, and to go into the vestry where the great man prays. We don't want to go down to the basement to the boiler room. But Spurgeon insisted, that's where you're going. That's the important place. They looked at one another. We don't want to see pipes and tanks and boilers. So he took them downstairs, down to the basement, down to what he called the boiler room and opened the door and there were 200 people on their knees praying. That's the boiler room. So you see, commitment to the boiler room, the Wednesday night boiler room, is the most hopeful thing in our congregation. And if we're too busy for the boiler room, then we're probably too busy. Am I oversimplifying it? I don't think so if you take a span of time. John Wesley, you know, once said, I am so busy this week that I will have to give myself to four hours of prayer. It's having the burden for the boiler room. The burden because we recognize it's not just focusing on, on our little patch or 
my little task. But what we're doing when we come together is in a sense the New Testament counterpart of what the people of Israel were doing in the Old Testament in Judges chapter 4. On a Wednesday night we're coming together to cry to the Lord for the nation. To cry to God for the children of our land. To cry to God for the congregations in Scotland and beyond. To cry to God for the work of mission throughout the world. To cry to God for the people of this parish. That the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers. If we do that, we expect God to answer, don't we? We expect God to raise up some leaders in, in government and people in business. We expect God to raise up preachers and ministers in the land. We expect God to, to raise up workers and helpers for the gospel here in our congregation and locally. It's a question of investing prime time. Matthew Paris in the Times newspaper I wrote an article about the distinction between investment and spending. Apparently Mr. Blair is using the word investment all the time instead of spending. And Paris says, well there is a difference between the two words. Spending is neutral, but investment is laying out with the expectation of profits. Wednesday night prayer meeting is an investment of prime time. When we have a busy week, what's the first thing to go? It's the prayer meeting, isn't it? Well, I think the instruction is here for us. There's been a good spirit of prayer these last two weeks, and certainly on Wednesday night there was an urgency, wasn't there? And crying to God. That's the most hopeful sign. I do hope that you encourage David over the Wednesday nights and the next three weeks and the Saturday morning prayer meeting and support him. Cry to God. You see, God's methods are consistent. People pray and God raises up helpers. Well, that's the second particular instruction. Here's the third. It teaches us that God's enemies are considerable. Well, there's an understatement. Who and what were against the Israelites? Well, it was the Canaanites. And remember, the Canaanites were not a bunch of primitive cavemen. For their age, they were very advanced, technologically, industrially, and economically. The Canaanites, you know, according to the book of Zephaniah, became shrewd businessmen. One of their many, many cities, it's mentioned in verse 2, Hazor, was reckoned to have a population the size of Falkirk, just down the road. And that's about 40,000, isn't it? Their army was equipped with 900 iron tanks, verse 3. By contrast, Israel's whole population was reckoned to be around 40,000 at this time. And amongst the whole bang shoot of the population according to chapter 5 verse 8 there was not a shield or a spear to be seen it really was bows and arrows versus armed tanks God's enemies were considerable and they always have been and always will be and that's certainly the case today and perhaps we can say that the anti-God forces in our society are stronger than ever before in our history. I think there are grounds for saying that. But that's not just dramatizing the situation. Look at broadcasting. Look at BBC television and its channels and independent television and Channel 4 and Channel 5. Look at the newspapers, the broadsheets and the tabloids. There are one or two exceptions. But a strong anti-Christian bias in the media, we'd have to agree with that. Look at the realm of politics and business and entertainment. And amoral militancy is certainly on the increase. As it was with ancient Israel. The odds seem to be stacked against us. As they were against them. 
But you know, the tactics of Israel are fascinating here. Fascinating. Deborah, under God's command, tells Barak to take 10,000 men and march up to the top of the hill in Mount Tabor, which was 10 miles southwest of the Sea of Galilee. Those who have been over to Israel can locate that in their minds. And so Barak, like the grand old Duke of York, does it. Verse 9. Why? Well, all the iron chariots below on the plain can't get them up there on the mountains. Chariots and tanks are not effective up there. So far, so good. But then the lady gives another order. Go down to the plain with 10,000 men. March down with them. So, is Barak going to be the authentic grand old Duke of York and do that? Seems he had to, for this lady's not returning. But on the face of it, it was suicidal. 10,000 people marching down to the plain with perhaps 10 times that number below with 900 iron tanks to engage them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Suicide. So will Barak do it? Will he obey the order? That's the battle that Barak had. Do you see the battle that he's got? This is the essential battle that we've got. It's the battle of faith. Is Barak going to believe? Is Barak going to obey? What's he going to do? It's a tremendous battle for him in his own heart and soul. It's a tremendous battle for us as we face the world, the flesh and the devil. What are we going to do in this hostile society with all these anti-God forces, anti-Christian forces against us? What are we going to do? Are we going to believe God, trust God, obey God? It all seems so foolish and powerless. Suicidal almost. What are we going to do? This is the battle. And it's a tremendous battle. So are we going to be real warriors of faith or just toy soldiers? God's enemies are considerable. Then the fourth particular instruction is this. Salvation's works are marvelous. This story tells us. Salvation's works are marvelous, or rather God's works are marvelous. All his ways are are marvelous. And incidentally, I think we'll change the last hymn tonight and have 600 sing to God new songs of worship. Deborah's song of triumph should be reflected by our song of celebration. And it has this line, all his ways are marvelous. Back to our grand old Duke of York, Barak. What did he do? 14b, he went down Mount Tamar with Tabor with 10,000 men and verse 15 he routed the enemy routed the enemy how on earth did he do it how did it happen well you know it's very interesting chapter 5 verses 19 to 23 strongly hints that there was a thunderstorm a flash flood and the river burst their banks probably in mid-bay and so what happens to the chariots with mud well the chariots become stuck in the muds salvation's works are marvelous now it was supernatural God did it his timing was amazing all the high tech, all the economic brilliance counts for nothing before the sovereignty of God. But the evil Caesarea escaped, like a James Bond movie, isn't it? The arch-villain always gets away at the end, drawing in a face-to-face -face combat in the last exciting scenes, while Caesarea ran away. Now, notice another little detail recorded by the storyteller in verse 11. It seems an incidental detail in verse 11. 
It just tells about a man and wife who move house to the other end of the country. That's all. The man and wife belong to a tribe which has links with the Canaanites, but the man and wife, wonder of wonders, have links going all the way back to Moses. Amazing. And they happen to be in the right place at the right time when the fugitive Caesarea stumbled into their own backyard. Jael was the wife's name, and the rest, as they say, is history. Amazing. God's providence. Salvation's works are marvelous. His impeccable timing. Last week, it's been a great joy to speak to those who are on the inquirer's class and to learn again the wonder of God's timing in people's lives. Somebody perhaps coming to the inquirer's class 12 months ago but didn't come and realizing he wouldn't have been ready and it would have been a mistake and now in God's timing, coming to faith, knowing Christ as Savior and Lord, God's timing the other way, bringing somebody along and saying, well, not yet, but surely we believe that in the unfolding of God's timing, it will be the right time. How God uses events and episodes and people in the past to weave together something that is absolutely beautiful. All his ways are marvelous. So God came down from the mountain and saved his people. That's the gospel, isn't it? God came down from high the second time to save his people in Jesus Christ. No human judge was the answer to Israel's needs. Why? Because each judge died. If only there was a judge and leader who would never die. A judge who would live forever. For we know that when God came down in Jesus Christ from heaven, he came as one who was ever going to live to make intercession for us. He came as one who was able to save to the uttermost all those who come to God through faith in him. On this great day for the kingdom and our congregation, let's renew our confidence in God's marvelous salvation and our marvelous Savior. For all the praise and glory belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's trust Him. Let's obey Him. Let's love Him. Let's follow Him with new resolve. May God bless his word to us tonight. Let's pray. Our mighty, eternal, everlasting Lord and King, we come before you as those who are trying to grasp the immensity of what you're doing in your universe and world and amongst the nations and in history and especially with your people the church struggling and battling shrinking it seems and hardly surviving and that is a larger picture of the individual scene as we ourselves see ourselves so alone and isolated we pray that from this study tonight we might have learned of the enduring principles and truths that you want us to learn. We ask, O God, that your word might get right into us tonight, that it might slay prejudice and uh, enter the comfort zones and bring to us a challenge and bring to us an inspiration to rise up and be the people who in these days are strong and do exploits 
We pray that your joy might be our strength, and that as we relate to you in faith and obedience as your people, that we might see the marvelous works of salvation unfolding in ever greater degree before us. Lord, you've given us a taste for these things. And we are hungry. You have said that if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you shall be filled. Grant to us that appetite, that ambition for your ways and for the coming of your kingdom and power to our place and parish and hearts. And we ask this. For Jesus' sake. Amen.